A group of climbers set out to scale a mountain. Uh, the view was breathtaking, white-capped mountain that went up and it was a blue sky. It was inspiring. And all the climbers walked briskly. Uh, they were eager to get there and get to the top. Uh, they got along with each other. They were kind to each other. Uh, though they were many, they were one in their purpose, following their dream to get to the top. The next day, they got up and they couldn't see the mountain. Clouds had covered it. The blue uh, sky was replaced with gray drab. That day, their thoughts became inward and their eyes were downward. Uh, the goal was forgotten. They couldn't see the mountain anymore. Tempers were short and weariness set in. That's the way it is with all of us, isn't it? When we lose sight of our goal, our dream, we get discouraged. If we can see our dream and where we're headed, we're encouraged. But take it away and the result is discouragement. Think about it. Hide the Nazarene who calls us upward toward the mountain, toward heaven, and see what happens. Listen to the groans of the climbers as they sit along the trail and they pause to break and they say, why do we keep doing this? What's the purpose? We can't even see the mountain. Why don't we just give up? Instead of looking upward at him, they begin to look inward at themselves and outward at each other. Mark it down, we are what we see. Like climbers scaling the side of a mountain, God calls us to walk with endurance the path he set before us. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul compares the life of walking as a follower of Christ to scaling a mountain or being a runner in an Olympic race. This is the 11th in our series, Fixer Upper. Chip and Joanna Gaines' show was on for five seasons. They fixed up houses. We're not talking about fixing up houses. We're talking about fixing up the way we think. We learn to think the way God wants us to think, to think Christianly, to think in the right way so that we can experience the joy and happiness God wants us to experience. God says, see, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. God wants us to choose life and joy, and laughter, and peace. He doesn't want us to choose death, and cynicism, and negativity, and bitterness. So how do we choose happiness? How do we learn to be satisfied with the life God has given us? The Apostle Paul shows us that it has a lot to do with the way we think. We choose to be happy, or unhappy. So far in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul has shown us three ways to think in the wrong way. One is to think that my circumstances dictate my happiness. Paul says, no, I was flogged illegally. I was thrown in prison. There I was awaiting trial before Nero and possible execution, yet I chose happiness and joy. A second wrong way to think is to think people determine our happiness. Paul says, no, everywhere I went, people were very unfair with me, and uh, uh, I was opposed everywhere I went, yet I chose joy. A third wrong way to think is to think negatively, to choose to always look on the dark side, when something happens and be pessimistic and cynical. Paul says, no, the way to think is to think positively. You think about what God can do in your situation. You think about the good that you have in your life rather than focusing on the bad. 
whether we choose negatively to live positively, negatively or positively, can have a great impact on whether we're happy or unhappy. The Apostle Paul chose to be happy. Turn to our text today, Philippians 3, 12 to 16. If you want to use the Bibles under our seats, it's on page 1180. At the beginning of chapter 3, Paul says, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. That's the theme of this book, a call uh, to joy. Uh, a lot of people are unhappy. Because they're bitter about terrible things that were done to them early in their life. Or guilty about bad things they did. If we want to know happiness, we have to forget the past and focus on the future. You can't do anything about your past, but you can do something about your future. The right way to think is to look forward past your past. Paul identifies at least three steps in this text that show us how we can pursue happiness by looking forward past our past. The first step is dissatisfaction. Verse 12, Paul writes, Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. Paul says, I haven't obtained, I haven't reached my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Uh, this is striking. The most spectacular Christian who ever lived said that he has not arrived. He was dissatisfied with how far he had gotten spiritually. I find that encouraging to me. There are times that I feel like I'm a pretty good person, like I'm a strong Christian, like I'm doing this good. There's other times when I do something stupid. I feel like a failure. I figure, why do I have to keep doing the same things over and over again? Why can't I get better? Then I look at the Apostle Paul and I see that he didn't see that he had arrived. It's always good for us to have a healthy dissatisfaction with our past. Paul was, for, was determined to forget his past. He could have lived with regret for uh, the years he spent uh, persecuting the church. But instead, he looked forward to what he can do with the rest of his life. That's the right way to think. Some of us get stuck in the past. We think if we've made a mistake, God will never forgive us. We'll never be in God's will again. We view God's will as kind of a, a big egg, a, a humpty dumpty. Make one mistake or at the most two and no one. Not even God can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. God forgave all the sins of the world when Jesus died on the cross. Your sins have been forgiven if you've given your life to Christ and asked you to forgive you. God says of believers, their sins <clears throat> and lawless acts, I will remember no more. So if you're plagued by guilt from something from the past, Look at the cross and remember that Christ died for all your sins. They're forgiven. Don't live in the past. Don't live with regret. Karl Barth spoke out against Nazi Germany <coughs> during the war, so he was banished from Germany. He lived out the war in Basel, Switzerland. After the war was over, he was invited to Princeton uh, to speak. Princeton in years past was a center of evangelical thinking, particularly uh, evangelical Presbyterian uh, pastors. And uh, after he had spoken, he had question and answer time and Adolf Eichmann had just been uh, uh, found in, in South America and arrested and, and the person said, now that Eichmann's been found, Eichmann was uh, Hitler's uh, leading henchman on the, the whole uh, final solution to, to kill 6,000 Jews. Now that Eichmann's been found, is it fair to say God's judgment falls on Germany? And Bart replied, he says, no. 
God's judgment has fallen on quite another man, Jesus of Nazareth. All your sins and mine fell on him. Remember that all your sins have been forgiven. You don't need to live bound by your past, things you've done. Those are forgotten. It also means that other people's sins have been forgotten. He died for all sins in the world. You know, maybe you're keeping score with how your mate's not doing very well. Or your sibling. Or your employer. Or a classmate or a friend. Don't do that. All their sins have been forgiven too. You don't need to hold score on them. We're supposed to be gracious because God has been gracious with us. Are you living in bitterness from things done in the past to you? Or in guilt by things you've done? Don't do that. Leave the past behind. That's the way to live and you'll be a lot happier. The second step to looking forward past your past is direction. Paul continues, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Picture a runner in a race. The runner has to keep their focus on the goal. They can't be looking around at fans in the stand, you know. They can't be looking behind them to see who's closest. They have to keep their focus on the finish line. If we're to make the greatest impact for Christ in this world, we have to keep our minds focused on our direction to honor Christ with our lives and to serve him with our whole heart. Dr. Ayi Kiev, clinical professor of psychiatry at Cornell University, in his book Strategy for Daily Living, writes, why don't you read this with me? The establishment of a goal is the key to successful living. In my practice as a psychiatrist, I have found that helping people to develop personal goals has proved to be the most effective way to help them cope with problems. Observing the lives of people who have mastered adversity, I have noted that they have established goals and sought with all their efforts to achieve them. From the moment they decided to concentrate all their energies on a specific object, they began to summit against the most difficult odds. When we know the direction we're going, when we know our goal is to know Christ and serve him, we have a better shot at forgetting our past. It's helpful to look at what uh, happened in Elisha's life when God called him to be the prophet of Israel. This is 1 Kings 19, 19. So Elijah, prophet of Israel, went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Uh, Elisha was having a day like most any other day, plowing in his field as a farmer. He was living the life that God had given him. Probably never in his wildest dreams or secret hopes did he think his life would, 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 would be anything else. While he had dust in his, uh, in his, in his mouth and, and mud caked on his face, sweating from labor, Elijah showed up and threw his, his cloak around him, a symbol that God had chosen him to replace Elijah as the next prophet of Israel. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said. Then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people. And they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now, this was a defining moment in Elisha's life. When he left his past to go find his future, after saying goodbye to his parents, he literally set his past on fire. He slaughtered the oxen. Then he took the wooden uh, plowing equipment and used those to burn the meat. Or cook the meat, I guess is probably a better way to put it. I burn the meat when I cook, Jeff. 
He gives the meat to all the people and they eat and they celebrate. Then after everything in his past life has turned to dust and ashes, he turns to follow Elijah. This was Elisha's declaration that there was no turning back. If things didn't work out with Elijah, he didn't have any oxen and plowing equipment to go back to. He had only one direction, his future. If we want to experience happiness, there not only has to be a, a dissatisfaction with our old life, we have to go all in on our new direction of following Christ. The third step to looking forward past your past is determination. Verse 14. Reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. He doesn't just forget his past, but he presses on toward the goal of pleasing Christ, meeting Christ someday in heaven. If we are to maintain our happiness, we must stay determined to follow Christ to our life's end. A man was working for a company and his supervisor resigned, took a job at another company. So he applied to take his position. Several others in the company applied as well. This man was the most senior in the company and the most logical choice, but they passed over him to choose somebody younger and less experienced. He felt cheated, but he didn't quit. He stayed determined. He continued to be a good employee to do the best job he could do. Two years later, a senior vice president in the company retired. And he was hired to fill that position. A position that was several notches higher than the supervisory vision he would have had. He stayed determined. And he was given a much better uh, position. 90% of first business ventures fail. 90% of second business ventures succeed. But only 80% of people who fail at their first venture ever try again. A man had a business that was going quite well. They were increasing in revenues year after year. They had a good track record. But he had some new ideas, and so he went to the bank that he had worked with for years for a loan. They turned him down. So he went to a second bank. They turned him down too. He went to five banks that turned him down. Ten banks turned him down. Twenty banks turned him down. You would think he would get the message, you know, it's not going to happen. But he kept going. Thirty banks turned him down. He went to the 31st bank and they turned him down as well. At the 32nd bank, they said, we like your idea. We'll take a chance on you. He stayed determined. He kept after his goal. And finally, he was rewarded. I don't know what you're facing. I'm sure a lot of you are facing some tough things. But stay determined. Do not give up. The Olympics began in ancient Greece. I believe from this text and other texts that Paul has been to an Olympic event. He knows the commitment required of athletes. He compares the Christian life to running like an Olympic athlete with determination. The destination is Christ to know him fully in heaven someday. I'm struck as I read the Old Testament how many people started well but finished poorly. I made a list here. It's not everybody by any means, but how about Lot? 
Samson, Saul, Solomon, Asa, Uzziah, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Solomon was considered the wisest man in the world, short of Jesus Christ, of course. Under his reign, Israel experienced their glory years, their greatest 40, 40 years. The country was so wealthy, they had peace on all sides. And then Solomon got into politics. I don't mean that as a derogatory remark. I just mean that instead of focusing on obeying God, he thought he could create peace for his kingdom through political means. He began to make uh, treaties with countries all around. And the way he did that is by marrying the king's daughters. So he began to take wives from the countries all around. So now he's made two mistakes. One, he's thinking he can protect himself politically rather than simply obeying God. And two, he's taken many wives in disobedience to God's command. By the end of his reign, he had drifted from God and compromised. He did not finish well. Hezekiah was a great reformer, king of uh, Judah. Judah had drifted from following God and he brought them back. He got rid of all the, the false idols they were worshiping. But then at the end of his reign, he became proud. Josiah was one of the last kings of Judah. He's the one, remember, who became king when he was eight years old. And Judah had drifted from following God and he brought them back and same thing, got rid of the, you know, all the idols and, and he was a great reformer. Then at the end of his reign, he foolishly went into battle without asking God for device and he got killed. All these leaders started well but ended poorly. I want to finish well. I want to hear the words, well done. Successful runners know that they can't be looking around at their competition. They have to keep their eyes riveted on the goal. The right way to think that brings happiness is to forget our past failures and look to our future. We can't do anything about the past anyway, only about the future. Our future is more important than our past. The point is to forget the past and stay determined on the goal of doing what God has called you to do in the future. How about you? Are you living in guilt because of something you did in the past? Forget it. That's been forgiven. Are you bitter because of something that was done to you by somebody else? Let it go. They've been forgiven too. Live the rest of your life in the joy of Christ's forgiveness. Looking forward past your past takes determination. But the good news is we don't have to do it on our own strength. In verse 12, Paul reminds us that Christ first took hold of us. Christ always initiates in a relationship with a person. I press on <clears throat> to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Christ first takes hold of you, and then you give your life to Christ. In Philippians 2.13, one of the best verses in the book, for it is God who has it work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. God works in us. He gives us the determination to leave our past behind and pursue our future. Like climbers scaling a mountain or Olympic runners running a race, Christians are in a race. Always keep a healthy dissatisfaction with how far you've come. 
Focus your direction on meeting Christ someday and run with determination. The right way to think is to look forward past your past. Would you pray? Father, thank you for these words of the Apostle Paul. It's encouraging to see that the Apostle Paul did not see himself as having <clears throat> accomplished everything spiritually. He had a long way to perfection. So it encourages us to see that uh, we too can leave our past behind and pursue our future. So I'd like to give you an opportunity to pray right now. Maybe there's some bitterness you have about things done to you or guilt about things you've done. Tell Christ you know those are forgiven and you want to leave those behind and pursue the only thing you can make a difference about your future. You pray right now. Thank you, God, for your forgiveness in Christ and that we have hope for a future. Help us to focus on that and not our past. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.